Church, grab your Bibles tonight and turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 46 in our study in the book of Isaiah. I'm hesitating because I want to say Isaiah chapter 46 just might be one of my favorite chapters of the book of Isaiah. And then I start thinking about Isaiah chapter 53. And then I start thinking about Isaiah 63 and Isaiah 66, and maybe I'll reserve for saying that. But it is an awesome chapter. Isaiah chapter 46, and it's just 13 verses, but they're very powerful. And we're looking at a message tonight that is entitled, Things That Are Impossible. I'm going to ask you to write that down. Things That Are Impossible. By Christian nature, we are not taught to think or speak like that. We're supposed to say that everything's possible. And I understand that, and you're right. But there are some things that are impossible because man cannot do them. You and I cannot pull it off. The religions of the world cannot do it. Good works or efforts cannot do it. There are things that without God are absolutely impossible. And salvation is going to be one of those things. We're going to learn tonight about the prophetic nature of our God. Things that are impossible, but God can do them. Things that are going on in your life and my life that might seem to be impossible, but God's got an answer for them. And God is speaking to them. And I pray that tonight is encouraging. And that it might affect your view of how you think about God. In fact, A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I want you to look at that quote for a moment. It's absolute truth. What comes into your minds when you think about God. Pause right there, Tozer writes. When you think about God, what enters your head? What is that in your mind? God who? What is he like? This God that you and I claim to believe in, what are his characteristics? How do you know him anyway? You've never met him. You've never seen him. How do you know? How can you be here tonight? It's a Wednesday summer night in the middle of October. You could be anywhere right now. What are you doing here? You have come to seek God. You've come to draw closer to God. You've come to learn more about God. Tozer writes, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And you want to know why? Because our understanding of who God is literally shapes the person that we are becoming in Christ. It, it molds who we are becoming. By the way, the reverse is true in the negative if you are a worshiper of a false god. It is a fact that you become like the god or gods that you worship. And Isaiah is going to point that out tonight. So the first thing that we see regarding things that are impossible is in verses 1 to 4. And it is this. It's that false worship cannot help you. God is speaking through the prophet. And he's warning the nation of Israel and Judah to the south. That false worship will always leave you bankrupt. He says, Bel bows down and Nebo stoops. We'll talk about those in a moment. Their idols were on their beast and on the cattle. Your carriages, or carts, some of your Bibles say, were heavily loaded or laden, a burden to a weary beast. They stooped, they bowed down together. Note this, they could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Two things we want to write down and note right now are these two names that are mentioned right at the start. God says, okay, here's the deal. Bel, and you need to know this, Bel is the root word, and I wish I had a chart. I couldn't find one that was good enough, but imagine in your mind, when you go all the way back to ancient Babylonian worship, Bel, B-E-L, is one of the chief gods of 360 gods that the Babylonians worshipped. They had a god for each day. They had a 360-day calendar. By the way, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is based on a 360-day calendar. And the Babylonians had a god for every day. And Baal, Baal, we get Baal, is this one particular god that when you study and unpack his names throughout cultures and generations. From empires to empires, you begin to look at his name because, you know, the Grecians had different names. 
for the gods that the Babylonians had. They just renamed them. Same gods over the same uh, realm. If it was the god of nature in Babylon, it's the same god of nature in, in uh, Grecian uh, mythology and belief, but they changed the name. But this one Bel, or Baal, you recognize him, is the uh, Phoenician or Canaanite Baal, when you look at all of it and trace the word usage and meanings all the way back, you come to an ancient god. Uh, now listen, it's not Uber like the car lift or drive, the taxi service, but Hooper is an ancient god, and from that ancient Sabean word or name, Sabean culture, they worship the gods of the Babylonians, this particular name is the actual root god of the moon. The, the crescent moon of Islam is not new to Islam. That crescent moon icon was the very Baal icon of the ancient Sabaeans in Babylonian worship. And God says that those idols will fall. Nebo the root word of that, you've heard of Nebuchadnezzar, right? His name comes from the worship. He was named after that god. Belshazzar, uh, Baal, all named from that particular god. And this is what the Lord says. They're all going to fail. They're going to come tumbling down. And you put them on carts, God says, because Israel had adopted these false gods. You've rejected God. You've, you've accepted now these false gods. You put them on carts, and God is basically saying, watch this, Israel. This is what's happened to you. You have forsaken me. You've gone after these false gods. They've got to be put on carts and pulled through the city. Have you ever thought of such a thing? Is that ridiculous or what? Well, it happens all the time. It happens in every culture. And they pull around this icon. They pull around this image. They pull around this thing. Now, church, I've been very, very nice to you tonight and sensitive. I went on YouTube today, and I Googled idols falling off of carts. <laughs> and I almost died laughing. And then I realized tonight I couldn't show you that because it might so offend someone because there were various gods from the world, and they're, these are modern-day clips of people in, in parades and things, and they're marching along with their god on these carts, and, and the people marching stumble and fall, and the god falls over, the head falls off, and the people are crying and screaming. They're trying to put the god back together, and I'm not kidding you. One of them was in Mexico City, and it was Madonna. It was Mary, and she's on a cart, and she comes into the church service, and this one poor guy stumbles, and the whole thing comes crashing down, and people are screaming and crying. Mary falls down, her arms break off, her head falls off, and the people are losing control of themselves. It's like their world had come to an end. Listen, those are idols. I don't want to upset or offend anybody, but if you're looking to God through an idol, the Bible has a lot to say about that. And God says it's all coming down, and that's a form of false worship. Baal bows down. Nebo stoops. The, the load, the burden, has to be pulled by ox. Remarkable. But just because someone worships church in a spiritual context, just because they say they're worshiping, doesn't make it holy or righteous in what they're doing. Your worship is qualified based upon the object of your worship. Tonight, I encourage you to worship. Before a service began, I came out here and I said, you know, let's all worship and let's worship in spirit and in truth. Why? Because it's the object that which we worship qualifies the validity of the worship itself. And if you're worshiping things that can stumble and fall, then you're in trouble. And... We have the opportunity as believers to worship the eternal God. And what we do now, we're going to be doing in eternity forever. You say, well, I don't really like to worship. Then you're not going to like heaven at all. <laughs> what are you going to do there? Honestly, listen, we have wonderful worship here, but don't you still long on the inside of you to even, even somehow get into it more? I mean, I'm not a Pentecostal, hyper, running around crazy kind of a person, but I'm, I'm thinking... God, just, just 
just peel back the roof for a moment and show us your face. He doesn't need to do that, but you want it to happen anyway. You, go, you know, you go to a service and you want to hear God speak. You want to hear him move. And you think about that day when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts. The Bible says that it was the presence of a, the Lord was like a rushing mighty wind. Now look, we've got to be careful as worshipers of God because we're not to go to worship to have some effect. Oh, let's go worship because we get goosebumps when they, when they you know, do the lights like that or, the, or that, that person sings it. Oh, it just puts chills up my back. That's kind of weird actually. Because worship is not about what you can get out of it. It's all about what you're giving God in it. And, and David said, I'm not going to worship God in any way that doesn't cost me something. I mean this uh, affectionately and, 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 and honestly, but worship ought to cost us. It, that ought to be an expense to it. You say, well, I put a nickel in the bag a minute ago. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about worship when you go to worship God and your life seems to be falling apart around you. If you look around, or if neighbors are looking at you, or, or family members are looking at you, and, and, and your kids are sick, or your husband is dying, or your, your, your situation's broken down, and you choose in your grief to worship God, that's expense. That's a cost. And, and that's, that's a delight to God's heart. There's none of that in idol worship. Because idols are not real. They, they can't know. They don't know. And yet people remarkably worship idols. And you might say, Jack, you're so out of step with the culture. That, all that stuff is behind us. We are an enlightened generation. You know what? I actually want to say something in defense of idol worshipers. I am, that's right. I'm going to defend idol worshipers. In the old days, people had a statue, and at least they thought that that statue brought something to them. They attributed some sort of benefit from that statue or from that thing. Are you with me? Today, we worship nothing. You say, what? We're worse than they are. We don't attribute nature to some image. No, no, we say, oh no, nature and everything came out of nothing. That's, a, that's worse. Oh no, everything you see, isn't it beautiful? Everything you see, it's all fantastic. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it came from nothing. What an insult to God. Quite remarkable. The ancients at least thought, well, this, all of this had to come from something, and they ignorantly worshipped in their false system. Today, we've got so much of the revelation of God and the information that God has presented to us and the scientific ob observable equipment to look at God's amazing fine-tuned universe, and then we come to the conclusion, ah, oh, it's all a big accident. I think it's insulting to him. I wrote something down. I don't know if it's going to mean anything to you, but if we worship things that, number one, we have no idea what we're talking about, but we worship that thing, that's, that's strange. But number two, we also worship things that we have full knowledge of. It's either the pendulum swings one way, where we worship things that we have no knowledge of whatsoever, we just worship it. Or the pendulum swings the other way, and we know exactly what we're talking about, and we, and we actually worship that. See, what do you mean? Well, I'm kind of primed in that thinking, because earlier this week, Lisa and I were in Canada. And uh, we went on some tours, beautiful locations. And i, I got to tell you, I couldn't wait to get home to you, back to some sanity. Not because Canada is insane. Canada is fantastic. It's, it's beautiful and all that. But the people there are like the people here. But I was, I was on this tour in numerous stops. And here's the deal. Oh, well, this right here, isn't this fantastic? This is, this is where the whales come this way and this is what they do. And what did I write down? It's Mother Nature wanted us to enjoy uh, all of this. We looked at the fall colors, the trees turning color, and it was said, and, and this is what nature has given us. Now think about that for a moment. Are you guys all hearing me? Yeah. Mother nature saw too the fact that whales needed to swim this way and over here and do this. <laughs> and, and nature determined how these colors do what they do. Attributing all of these amazing attributes and characteristics, right, that you would put to a person? To what? Isn't it funny how people say Mother Nature, nobody even makes a peep. 
when it's really Father God. <laughs> but you can't say Father God because the people get offended at that. So you say Mother Day. Who's going to get upset with someone's mother? You can't do that. <laughs> Mother Nature just did this. And, and we heard it this week too. Over the course, the evolutionary process brought this about. And it's like, you're killing me here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a form of idol worship. And then I found out this week, have, do you know that, quote, we humans are most like the bonobos who were most likely our ancient fathers and mothers. Do you know, have you, or I didn't know this, but it used to be that we came from apes and monkeys, but now they have found out, you know. Now we know, they say, that we have come from bonobos. Do you know what bonobos is? Oh, this, some of you that are in anthropology, you're, you're getting mad at me right now. Well, everybody knows we came from bonobos. <laughs> a bonobos are the best example, I'm quoting now, from Britannica, of mankind's living ancestor. According to a new study, beware of new studies, researchers analyzing their muscular system, they're, they're analyzing the muscular system of bonobos, they have found that they are more closely related to humans than even the common chimpanzees. And they've come to this conclusion that this type of ape, this great ape, this bonobos, uh, is most likely our, our closest mom and dad. Now, you can look at that data and you can say, there's my uncle right there. <laughs> Might I submit to you that the reason why bonobos is anywhere close to us is because the same God made bonobos and made you. Well, you know, when you see everything embryonic, it all looks the same. We all look like fish. Have you ever seen a shrimp? Right? Embryonic shrimp and a human being and a dolphin and a monkey and an and a elephant. It all looks the same. They all look the same at the start. You want to know why? It's the same engineer that made them all. Instead, you look at that and you go, wow, God's amazing. People look at it and say, wow, you know what? Uh, we used to be a shrimp, elephant, <laughs> dolphin thing. Why do people look this way? Why do people think this way? It's because of false worship in the mind. Look, listen to verse 3. He says, uh, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me. This is God speaking. I've upheld you from birth, he says, who have been carried from the womb. The word is brought forth, brought out, brought forth. God says, this is me. Not false worship, not false gods. God says, here's the contrast of all the false worship systems of the world. God says, compare them to me. Number one, he says this, I have held you up. Now he's speaking to Israel, but rejoice in this that God has promised us who are in Christ all the promises that God has given his people. We've been grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. We're also studying about the nature of God. God says to Israel, and listen, friend, God says to you tonight, I have upheld you from birth. If you're listening right now, this is not an accident. This is not chance. This is not theory. If you're listening right now, if you can hear me right now, this is the plan of God. God has said, from your very birth, I have upheld you. You can choose tonight, as we go down through this study, to believe that or not. You have to make the choice. Nobody can make it for you. God says, I have upheld you. He goes on, listen to this. And he says, I've carried you from the womb. The word, as I said a moment ago, is I brought you forth out of the womb. Listen, all of us, as I look around, you've all been born. <laughs> You're here right now. Now, you could say, well, that's because uh, my biological mom and my biological dad got together and they had me, the, the byproduct of their biology, and, I, and I'm... I am a, uh, a homogenous mix of their DNA. I'm here. I'm them. And you can say that. But you're, you're skipping the fact that all of that 
description is a miracle. The conception of life, the formation of you in the womb, the, the birth of you coming out into this world. And you, again, might say in defense of your atheism or of your agnosticism, you might say tonight, oh, but that doesn't prove anything because I've had such a horrible life and if, if God brought me forth, boy, you know, that's not a very good story. Hey, listen, all of us have got a very, very uh, interesting story to tell. Some of us have got stories of abuse, sexual abuse, a child abuse, drunkenness, violence, go down the list, prostitution, murder. I mean, you don't even know for a moment who's sitting around you right now in church. And, and listen, and all of us could say, well, I can't believe in God because of this. And God says, I've been with you all the way through from the beginning. And again, choice. You can choose to blame him for all the wrong that's gone on in your life, or you can ask him, Lord, help me to get out of this mess. Look around the world. The world is insane. The world is hurting. The world is murderous. The world is mean. And when you pick up the Bible, you read the exact opposite of the nature of God. Do you not? And God is saying, look to me. Listen to me. I've upheld you from the very moment of your birth. I have brought you forth out of the womb. Verse 4, even to your old age. Wow, what a leap. From verse 3 to verse 4, even to your old age, I am he, and given the gray hairs, <laughs> even to gray hairs, I will carry you. Oh, friends, listen, circle the word carry. The word in Hebrew means, let me read it again, even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs, I will, listen, be pregnant over you and for you until the end. That's the meaning of the word. You say, what in the world? What? Yep, these words that God is using to communicate to us that he does the impossible. He is saying, I am pregnant over you with something. We're going to find out what that something is. Strange communication. God says, I brought you forth out of the womb. I've carried you along. And from the moment of your conception all the way through, verse 4, to you getting old with gray hair in the moment of your death, God is saying, I've been with you. I've been with you all along the way. And this is a serious challenge to all of us because the temptation is for us to think that God was not around when bad things were happening to us, right? Where was God? That's what we hear from our Jewish friends in Israel. You want me to believe in God? Where was God in the Holocaust? And he answers them in the Bible. Read Deuteronomy chapter 25 to chapter 28. He answers them. And all of the things of your life and mine, the rejection of our parents, uh, our father or our mother against our lives, uh, maybe us being left at the firehouse when we were an infant or uh, not allowed to be part of the family, so to speak, but the outcast, you name it, whatever it might be. Or maybe you had a great childhood, but maybe it was this way in life or that way at the company or, and you had all these things. This guy robbed you. These people ripped, whatever it is. And all of it that's gone on in our lives, God is saying to you, I've been with you all along and I'm committed to you all the way to the moment that your hair turns gray and that you lay your head down for the last time and you die. I am with you in all of your grieving and all of the stuff that you are repulsed by and that you cringe, the pain, the ugliness, the sorrow, the grief, the disease, God is speaking in all of that. And he's saying, this is not the end. This is not it. I will take you all the way through. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that does the impossible. Thank God for the impossible because that's what he completely does with just the snap of his finger. He says, I'm with you. And I wrote some things down regarding the meaning of that word. I will still be pregnant with the promises that I said I would keep you. Do you have promises in the Bible? Have you wondered maybe trials and tribulations of life, hardship, maybe... I remember... Uh, I guess all of us guys, I, I guess, right? I mean, didn't we all get in schoolyard fights? Or maybe if you didn't, but maybe you played some sort of sports or whatever, or soccer, football, you get kicked in the gut. You ever had the wind knocked out of you? It's funny, when you get the wind knocked out of you for the first time, I don't know, maybe you're five years old or you fall out of the swing set and you land on your stomach, you think you're dying. Do you remember that? You're, uh, 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 <laughs> you can't breathe. Life does that to us. Boom! 
and you feel like that tonight, maybe the wind has been knocked out of you. And you can't catch your breath. And God says, wait, 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 wait. I am pregnant with promises that I've made to you. I will keep them. You need to hear that tonight. I was talking to a friend some years ago. He's been, he was going through a tremendous time. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, I'm doing okay. The last time I checked, Romans chapter 8 is still in the Bible. <laughs> and I thought that was an awesome answer. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purposes. When was the last time you had to check on that verse, make sure it's still there? God says, I'm pregnant with promises for you. The second thing is, I will still be pregnant with promises to you that I would finish in your life what I started. That's a great comfort to me. What has God started in your life? Can you, can you find something that God has started in your life? It's God's plan to fully develop that. Let him do it. I will still be pregnant with promises that heaven is when and where everything in life will make sense. Church, listen. When verse 4 goes on, he says, I have made you. Look at it. I have made you. The word in Hebrew means, I, listen, this is a deep word. Asa is the word in Hebrew, and it means to think you forth. It's a bizarre word. God says, I have thought you into existence. You. I've thought you into existence. This is, a, this is a great comfort because you might say tonight, and I know there are people who make arguments that uh, people, uh, and this is one, less than 1%, thank God it's less than 1%, but even less than 1% is too much, but there, there are people who become pregnant by virtue of rape. And I've read some stories recently where a woman had been raped and brought the child full term, and that child turned out to be an incredible blessing in her life. And uh, the, the woman didn't sin, and the child didn't sin. But God brought beauty out of a horrible event. And you think about that for a moment where God says, in the end, every tear will be wiped away. And he even says, in the day of judgment, I'll take the wrath of man to praise my name. Somehow this freaked out world, church, and things that are coming against your life, your finances or your health or your, your spiritual uh, stability or whatever it's going on, personal, doesn't matter, everything that's crushing against you, God says, in the end, it's all going to make sense. And that's important to me because you know what? Not much of what this world does makes sense to me. I'm going to be really honest with you right now. The more I look around this world, I see the world nuts. The more I look around this world, I don't belong here. And that world that I say I don't belong here also says to me, we don't want you here. Think about it. The world does not want us here. I am, listen, soon, maybe tonight, everyone's dreams are going to be fulfilled. We won't be here and they won't have us here. I wish you Christians were out of here. Oh, so do we. Oh, so do we. Any moment. Oh, man. Someday it's going to make sense. It doesn't make sense now. Why, why do good people suffer? Why do, why do the wicked seem to prosper and do great? Why do these things happen? Listen, I don't know. I can come, I can only answer that to a point and then I got to let it go. Do you understand that, everybody? You have, you've got to let it go. This is where, listen, this is where he has given us enough of the revelation of who he is for us to step back and take a deep breath and trust him. Friends, listen, write it down if you need to. Get a tattoo. Trust him. <laughs> trust him. We have, we have to trust him. And that is true worship. False worship, you can't trust nothing because your God that you're walking with, if you trip over your robe and everything goes down and the heads are rolling and arms are breaking off, there goes your God and you're done. <laughs> if you've got to put your God on a cart and watch your step, you're in trouble. God says, I've made you. 
Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you and ordained you. And I have a, I, I have a line right there, because God's speaking to Jeremiah, and God says, I, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. But I, I've got little dot, 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 dot in my, in my notes, because ordained you, whoever you are, whatever you, you're doing. Fill in the blank. God says, I've ordained you to what? To be a mom, a dad, an engineer, a doctor, husband, wife. What is it? Where are you tonight? It's not an accident. God has been with you all along. Well, I'm not doing the career I want to do. Oh, that's fine, but God is with you. Well, I don't like this job I'm in and this thing, and what about that thing? And both of us, we've decided just about to end our marriage. Wait, God says he can fix it. They'll throw it away. Listen, the bruises, the bumps, the rough roads, the, the miles, all of the wear and tear regarding your marriage, stop right there because those things that look absolutely impossible, God takes those things and makes them tremendous learning devices that makes you wise for the future. You don't have to make those mistakes again. There's some people, look, I've seen it too many times in church life. It's pathetic. This person, they, this person winds up getting a divorce, gets married again, divorced, married again, divorced, and everything along the way, they take this thing that destroyed their marriage, they take it right into the next marriage, and the same thing destroys the marriage, and then they just take it, and the same thing destroys the marriage again. Best to stick it out and make it work. Seek God. He's got a plan. He does not forsake you. He brought you forth from the womb and he is walking with you as we shall see in a moment. Look what he says. He says, and I will bear you. You don't have to bear him. The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you don't carry him. He carries you. I bear you, God says. Christian, listen. God bears you. He'll carry you. He'll take you. By the way, that word, I will bear you. The word bear here in Hebrew is to go through it all together. It means to go alongside a person, to walk with them. You know anybody grieving tonight? You know anybody grieving? And you know as a friend, you, you want to be near them. And it's, it's sometimes, listen, and this is sometimes the best comfort you can ever give somebody. You know when someone's really hurting and you, you know you want to be alongside them to give them comfort, but you don't know what to say. Listen, whenever you don't know what to say, best to say nothing. Zip your mouth and just be there. There comes a time when grief cannot receive words. Just be there. And God says, I'll walk all the way through with it all with you. All along, I'll be alongside you. This is what God says. And look, he goes on to say, even I will carry you. That's that word carry again to be pregnant over you with promise, with hope. It implies all the way to the end. And I will deliver you. The word deliver is to keep, I love this word. It's to keep you, rescue you, and then, listen, to release you. Write that down. It is to keep you. God says, I'm going to deliver you. I'll keep you, I'll rescue you, and I'll release you. The scholars I read on this, their, their answer was this. That God keeps us in life. He rescues us from the wicked one, from the devil, from hell. And I love this. And once we breathe our last in this world and our first in his world to come, he releases us. The picture they said is you're released into the kingdom of the eternity of heaven with him forever. Think about that. God opens up the door. It's kind of like taking, taking a, a little kid to Disneyland. It's, it's, a, it's awesome. You watch their face. You have, you have little ones, you take them to Disneyland, and you don't, you're not looking at the junk there. You're looking at their face, aren't you? You're looking at their face, you know, oh, watch it, you get the camera, look at <gasps> Right? Aren't, don't you? Because they're like this. <gasps> oh, ah, oh, my, wow. And I see, I see that when the Lord, listen, and release them. Imagine Imagine when the gates, as it were, swing open wide and you enter heaven. Oh, my goodness. But I love the fact that it all starts out with him saying, I made you. All of this implies, and I think teaches clearly, that, you know, as God speaks in these terms of bringing us forth from the 
from birth, from the womb. There's a weird f- phase of our lives that we, we, we come to this place of thinking that we're okay now. We got it all under control. And I think that's a, I think that's a, a dangerous place. And what I mean by that is this. When you and I came forth into the world, the only way that you and I survived is that someone cared for us. Think about it. Somebody cared for us. Somebody gave us a bottle, changed our pants. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Somebody cared for us. We couldn't do anything for us. Without, without somebody totally taking care of us, we wouldn't have survived, right? And then we kind of grow up a little bit, and then we reach the teenage years, which are really dangerous because you think you know everything, you don't know nothing, and, uh, and this independence happens, and then you're going through life, and, and you begin to attribute any success to yourself, which is dangerous. And that's a form of idol worship. <laughs> you go from Baal and Nebo to me. <laughs> me, myself, and I, we did this. The trinity of me, we're brilliant. <laughs> I had this thought, so I did it. I've done well. (laughs) And there's people who live like this. And they might say to themselves, if I I get get more knowledge, if I get more education, I'm going to be like this, and that's it, and that's, why look at me. And listen, you know you're in trouble when you look down at people, and you may not say it, or maybe you do, but inside your heart you're thinking, these poor imbeciles, if they only had the education that I've had. (laughs) That's scary. But you know what? Not all is lost, because as time progresses, your body begins to age. Things begin to happen. Or or you're not landing the deals that you once landed, and that income is not what it once was, and all of a sudden, what you had isn't enough. Well, I've got a million, now I need two, now I need ten. I've had this, and now I've got to get the other, and... And the world can't satisfy. It's, it, can't, it, it's, it, it, it never satisfy. But when we seek after idols to get meaning, when, right, when life hits like it does and it's rough, it evaporates. And it comes down to this. I, listen, didn't Job say it? Naked, naked I came and naked I go. Blessed be the name of God, right? You and I came into this world, we we're completely dependent upon people wearing diapers and needed to be fed. And listen, we, we, we lived through that time frame of thinking that we got the world by the tail. And once we transition out of that, uh, we're, we're naked again in diapers and needing to be fed. <laughs> <laughs> until, until it's over. <laughs> and here's my conclusion. All along the way, it's never, it's never been any greater or any less. It's been constant, constant constant, and that is, I need God. Constantly, constantly, I need him. I'm breathing right now because of God. He's amazing. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 says, for my thoughts, listen, friends, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, this is God speaking, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in that thing for which I sent it. God says, you cannot know, Jack, What's going on in your life, you can only know to a point, and then it's beyond you. Church friends, listen, i got to wrap this up. We'll pick it up next time together. you got to hear this. The stuff that's going on in your life, you want answers to those things. You're not going to get the answer. I want to know why. The... You're not going to know. You, God may give you a little bit of insight, but you're not going to know. Christian, listen. It takes no faith in God if we know Everything that's happened in our lives it takes no faith. I had a lesson, and I'm going to carry it with me. Lisa and I were in Canada. We were on a cruise. It was great because we were the, like the youngest people on this cruise. But 
We felt so young. <clears throat> but I got to tell you, we're out in the Atlantic. We just sailed just south of uh, Newfoundland. And uh, we're really close. They were talking to us about how the Titanic went down not far from us. That's very comforting when you're on a boat. <clears throat> and man, uh, that big ship's going 22 knots. That's pretty fast for a, for a big boat. So it's not fast. Well, all of a sudden, it got so foggy. It was so dense. And then by, I guess it's international law. I don't know. I, I think so. Because anyway, the ship would go. Like every two minutes. It's so foggy. And I look down and the, the ship is going through the black Atlantic at night. And I'm like, oh, mama, Lord. <laughs> okay, Lord. And I'm trying to remember verses where Paul shipwrecked in the sea. And oh, man. And then I'm thinking, Sir, I'm not kidding. Lord, just bless the satellites, GPS, the captain up there. May nothing be out there. And then the next morning, I saw one of the workers, and I said, man, that's, that was crazy. That was crazy. What was crazy? The fog. Do you see the fog? Oh, yeah. And I said, uh, do you ever get anxious about that? I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's a guy up there driving this thing. I don't like that part. <laughs> God is fine, but put your trust in a man? You know what I'm saying? And the guy looked at me and he said, no, man, I trust my captain. I've been sailing with this guy for nine years. I trust my captain. And it's like, that's a pretty convicting, awesome statement he just made. <laughs> because immediately I thought of my captain. You see, I want all the answers. You want all the answers tonight. You're not going to get the answers. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And the Bible warns us, don't lean on your own understanding. This is where the Christian, who God has given us overwhelming evidence where our faith is founded upon fact, but this is where the Christian and the rubber meets the road. Because you have cancer tonight. But I love, listen, I've, I've heard this a thousand times, and I'm not knocking it. I may wind up saying it the, the, when, if I get cancer, and you need to tell it right back to me. But this is what we hear from people, and I understand where it's coming from. Pastor Jack, I love God, but I have cancer. Do you not understand? Do you understand those two things are completely irrelevant? They don't connect. Did you know that? It has, one has not, nothing to do with the other. To say or to believe what you're saying is to say that God gives cancer to those he doesn't love. That's impossible. We live in a world that's fallen. This is a world that gets sick because of sin. Jesus died on the cross for my sins and your sins. He died there. You'll never see hell, but we will see war and sickness and injustice. I am so tired of people whining about this black lives matter, white lives matter, blue lives matter, green lives matter. Are we so stupid to begin to think that a certain people group, their lives matter less than others? Listen, God says all lives matter. But when we remove God from our minds, we get all feely, freaky, and weird. And we get all, listen, God loves all of us. We need to get our eyes off the culture and get our eyes on God. He loves you. God doesn't, God doesn't look at colors. He doesn't look at colors. Well, aren't there injustices in the world? There have been, there is, and there shall be until God comes back. It's going to happen. Not to make an excuse for it, but it's going to happen. Here's the deal. If I know that's the way it is because it's in human heart, what do I do? I don't worry about the captain up at the front of the boat. Uh, I put my fix on the captain that's steering the universe. that would change your life. But we have made so much stuff in our culture our idol. We want government to fix everything. There are certain things that God says, trust me. I know what I'm doing. And we need to hear this tonight. 
When we complain, we're not trusting. Well, why are we having to move into a tent? <laughs> you know, you know. If you think about it, if the honest answer, really deep, 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 let's dig deep. Honest answer. I don't know. <laughs> think about it, right? Think about it. I don't know. I do know that the technology advancements and stuff that's needed regarding getting the word out. That part I got. I got that part. But what, why really? We may not know until we're in heaven. Well, I just bought a new car and I put a Christian sticker on it. And the day I put a sticker on my car, it got hit. <laughs> why did that happen? <laughs> I don't know. Trust God. What are you going to do? Um, look, I refuse to trust God. Then you are going to be seriously messed up for the rest of your life. You're going to be bitter. You're going to be a victim. And you're going to be in the corner. And you're going to sit there. And you'll waste your life. No, I would rather lean on him who does the impossible. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, God. You're awesome. And you remind us, Lord, through so many things. Even tonight... It's amazing to realize that in a moment we're going to stand up. That's a miracle. That you've given us the ability to stand up. And even if someone's here tonight that can't stand up, but they have to be either uh, taken by wheelchair or by crutches, just for them, Lord, to be alive right now, to have a moment to turn to someone and say, God is good, is a miracle. The fact, Lord, that we turn to you and we say that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that, Lord, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to pretend to control everything. I'm going to trust you, Lord, with this challenge that's in my life right now because you're not the kind of God that's carried on a cart or some burden Rather, you're the opposite. You put me on the cart of your heart. You have put me in the palm of your hands. Church, you know, there's nothing more precious. In fact, in the, in the prayer meeting this evening before uh, service, someone had prayed that as we were praying for the persecuted church, uh, there has been a, a 17-year-old daughter of a pastor, I, I forget what country, but um, the prevailing religion of that country, uh, they've been persecuting Christians and specifically pastors, and, and I, I, was, I just shuddered when I heard this prayer request go up tonight for the fact that a 17-year-old daughter of a pastor had been kidnapped by this terrorist organization and taken away in the night and and I thought and immediately there's like a hole in my stomach I just I just thought of being that man and waking up uh, from moments of sleep and every time you wake up you relive that nightmare your baby's gone you don't know what's it would be better to know that she's dead and with Jesus than to be in the hands of terrorists and we began to pray for the salvation of the terrorists we began to pray for protection. And someone in the prayer meeting said, Lord, let her, let her feel, if she's alive, if she's on this earth still, let her sense and feel your presence. Yes. And you know, you think about that. Tonight you might be in a hospital. Maybe you're watching right now by virtue of the app or you're streaming somewhere in the world right now and you're laid up. And you know, it's amazing because in that same prayer meeting tonight, there was, there's a, a pastor that's in prison and I, it's either North Korea or Nigeria or Niger. I forget, it doesn't matter. But he's been given the opportunity to be released. And he's asking to stay because he wants to keep ministering to those that are in prison. Listen, that's impossible, right? Think about it. That is impossible if we look at it through the eyes of the flesh. But if you have the presence of God in your life, all of a sudden... A prison cell or your captors or even a black 
foggy Atlantic Sea is okay. It's okay. And all those buts, but I have cancer, but I have no money, but I have no this, I have no that. All of a sudden, those things, they don't go away, but they no longer have power because of the presence of God. And Father, I pray tonight for this flock this evening, these Wednesday nighters. Jesus, that all of our lives tonight, each and every one of us, for the demands that are pressing against us, we pray that you'd fill those demands, the pressures of them with your presence. Decisions to be made, issues at hand. We are inviting you, Lord, to manifest your presence in these issues and to bring healing of our soul. Give us that peace that passes all human understanding. And Father, may whatever we want to complain about or grumble about or worry about, as Gia just sang a moment ago, we become undone in your presence. And when we're undone before you is when we're made whole. So may we, Father, practice the presence of God, the presence of you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said,